everybody, welcome back to our Materials Informatics series. This is video, what, number 23 in the series. So if you're just tuning in now, realize that there's a bunch of previous videos where we talked about the basics of materials informatics and things that we've covered so far, featureization, simple algorithms, stuff like that. Uh, and we're getting into the more complex algorithms. And today we're gonna do that by talking about convolutional neural networks, which are revolutionary. That's not just my opinion. These have absolutely revolutionized deep learning. Uh, the main thing that they do is they allow us to give all the benefits of a neural network, of a vanilla, basically, you know, regular neural network, but without the feature engineering. What do I mean by that? Well, take a look at here, right? So here you see a sort of simple, you know, one hidden layer neural network, and I've got a bunch of things on the left. Let's say that those represent features on animals, like maybe it's a one-hot encoding of do these things exist in the animal? Does it have a snout? Does it have an eye? Does it have a tail, right? I play these games with my kids all the time, right? I'm thinking of an animal and they have to ask these questions. And given enough information, they can combine those features together and they can say, oh, it must be a goat or it must be a snake or whatever, right? So I would say that vanilla neural networks, these basic ones, they do a really good job of finding patterns, nonlinear complex patterns, especially as you add da uh, layers of depth, they can find patterns in the features provided so that, you know, as different, you know, inputs get activated, they can combine them together and say, ah, we must be talking about a sparrow versus a zebra, right? But here's the catch. You would have to tell it that those features are present or not. So you would have to featureize it, right? But what if you don't have that, like, information? What if you just have a picture of a cow? Well, how do you, from that picture, pull out the fact that it has a snout, that it has hoofs, that it's got four legs, right? How do you do that? Um, that's where convolutional neural networks come in and provide something which is really revolutionary, right? Uh, so, for example, take a picture here. This is from the MNIST data set. We've already talked a little bit about this in the series. It's a bunch of handwritten numbers, like the ones you see on the left here, and there's the label corresponding to what the number was supposed to be. Like, we know that all of these were supposed to be the letter, or the number one. These are all supposed to be number two, right? So we have a label, and we have a bunch of examples. Now, a traditional neural, neural uh, vanilla neural network would just take this image, let's say it's a 28 pixel by 28 pixel, right? It would take every one of those pixels, 784 or whatever it is, and it would just make a single one-dimensional column by just flattening all these things together. It would literally just take them and concatenate each row after another until you have one big long row, 784 long. And those would be your inputs. And then your neural network would do what it does, right? It would go from those uh, 10 different classes that it might be and it does a soft min to figure out which one it thinks is the right one, okay? Well, what's the problem with this? The problem with this is that nowhere in this approach does it take into account the fact that you might have like a white line here but below it might be a black line and then below that might be another white line as the three kind of comes around again and then below that black and below that white. So this sort of spatial orientation of your information in this array gets lost because again we just flatten it down to a single column and we lose all that spatial information. The entire premise, the key assumption behind neural networks, that, uh, a convolutional neural network, is that we ought to include information about how each pixel is spatially oriented with the pixels all around it, that there's information there that could help us, right? That That's one of the key assumptions um, and because of this convolutional neural networks are extremely good at learning from image data. Now, to be very, very effective, they take advantage of two key things. They have convolutions and they have pooling, right? So you see in this diagram here, it says convolution one happens using some sort of kernel. We'll describe what that is in a second. And then there's a pooling step, and then there's another convolution step and another pooling step. So what on earth is going on? If you look at this image, we start out with one image, but you see when it goes one step in past the convolution, now it looks like there's a bunch of these images stacked up on each other, so what's happening there? And then it looks like the size of the image is changing. Yeah, you see that it's a 28 by 28 at first, but it gets condensed down to a 24 by 24, and then it gets condensed down to a 12 by 12, and then an eight by eight, and then a four by four. So something's happening where we're changing the dimensionality, and we're also increasing the number of images, if you will, um, by the time that we're done with this portion of the neural network. Now. Before we're done, we then flatten this down, just like we did before, we took this image and we flattened it down to a single column. At the end of our convolution pooling layers, we are gonna do the same thing. We're gonna flatten that down to a single input, right? And then we use a neural network, what's something like a, a fully connected neural network to find the patterns in those. So because of that, the stuff that's happening on the left over here in the convolution and pooling layers, we call that feature extraction. And the stuff on the right, 
is where the classification or the regression takes place based off of those features. So let's get into some of the details. First off, all CNNs or convolutional neural networks, they're made up of these convolutions and pooling layers, right? So what exactly are those things? Well, a convolution is when you convolve one matrix with another. What on earth is a convolution, right? So when you convolve something, let's take a kernel. This is just a smaller matrix, right? Let's fill it with some numbers. Let's do 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, and then 1, 0, 1. You could have picked any shape, but let's imagine this one because that's one that corresponds with this picture, right? If you took this kernel and you laid it on top of your original image, it's going to take up more than one pixel because this is a 3 by 3 matrix, and so we're going to have to lay that over a, sing, you know, a, a portion of the image, but it's not going to be a single pixel. So let's imagine it's this purple region over here. That's where we're going to put the kernel on top of our original image. If we now do matrix multiplication of these two different matrices, take a look. You can see that the zeros, which are located at the top, left, right, and bottom, they're going to turn some of these values into zeros, right? They're going to take this one and make it 0, 0, 0, and 0. And the other ones are all multiplied by 1. So when we're done, if we do matrix multiplication, the dot product here, we're going to add it up. And what you'll see is that when we multiply and add it up, that adds up to 1, 2, 3, 4. And so you stick a four in the first entry of your convolution output, right? So you start out with an input. When you do a convolution, it's going to produce a, it's sort of like a transformation of your initial matrix. And then when you've done that first step, you now do a, you now convolve your filter over to the next spot. So see how I've located, I've rotated, I haven't rotated, I've translated it over one pixel and we do the exact same thing. I'm going to put my, you know, zeros, I'm going to allow them to turn things to zero. Everything else is a one. We add it up, and now it's a two. So the first entry over here in our con convolved matrix was four, followed by two. And you could keep on doing this, and you'd see that this one, if you slide it one or more over, it gives you two. Slide it over the last one, it gives you three. And when you're done, going across the row this way, then you start back over with the next pixel down and the next row down. Okay, And you keep on convolving this until you completely fill your image. That will give you what we call a convolution. So why <laughs> more on why in a second that's the that's what's happening we'll talk about why we do that in a moment we then follow that with a pooling step you do a convolution and then you typically follow it with a pooling step pooling is different pooling instead of doing a matrix multiplication we also have a filter a smaller region in this case maybe it's a two by two filter right and we're going to put that filter right here and then we're going to say inside that two by two area give me since this is a max pool Give me the biggest number. What's the maximum number? And in that one, you'd say 2. Then we're going to do something called a stride 2, maybe. And a stride 2 means don't shift it over 1 pixel, shift it over 2 pixels, right? And do the same thing. Well, in that one, it's also 4. And then you come down here and you do your next one. And in that area, the biggest number is 3. And then over here, it's 5. What pooling does is a couple things. It's reducing the dimensionality, right? We went from, we started out with a 6 by 6 and that turned into a 4x4 four four because the kernel was a 3x3 three three and it, we can't slide it over every single pixel so we ended up reducing our dimension a little bit and then with pooling we reduce that dimension from a 4x4 four four down to a 2x2 two two. the goal of doing this is to extract just the most important information and throw out the stuff that didn't matter so things that have a high signal let's try and keep those but toss the things that don't matter more on why we do this in a moment, but this is kind of what's happening. When you hear about a convolution or a pooling, it's typically something like that, okay? Now, I mentioned earlier that convolution and pooling is done because this allows us to extract features from an image automatically, and then at the end, we put it together with a fully connected network to find patterns in that data. So how does it do this feature extraction from an image? Like for example, this picture of these boats, if I wanted to say that a boat's there, I'd see water, I see things that kind of look like they come to a point, I'm seeing you know, two of them and it looks like they're next to a dock, so my brain kind of has this information, but your neural network doesn't have any of that. It doesn't have those custom features. So instead, what it needs to do is through this process of convolution pooling, convolution pooling, it needs to learn what sort of shapes and colors and edges and things are present in this image and once it finds those, those are now your features, you can then find patterns based off of those features uh, to figure out that, yeah, sure enough, that's a boat and not a bird or something. So how on earth do these kernels 
um, help us find things like edges, shapes, corners, colors, gradients, to the point where you can actually say that's a boat and that's a cat, right? Well, here's an example. Take a look at this image of this house. In this image of this house, we're going to try and take four different kernels, shown here, this one on the top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right, and we're going to convolve them over this image and then see what it gives us. If you convolve it, again, we're doing matrix multiplication at every single position that we can. Let's see what the output would be. Well, with this filter, or this kernel, this is the output filter of that kernel. So you can see that this uh, kernel, it sort of has like big numbers and then slightly less positive and then zeros and then negative and then more negative numbers. So that one, as you can see in this image, does a really good job of finding horizontal lines in your image. Whereas this one over here is a different kernel, right, with its sort of shape. It does a really good job of finding where there are X's, right, where there's diagonal, not just X's, but where there's diagonals in your data. You can see that it's finding these diagonals with the roof and here in the windows. It's doing a good job there. This filter over here looks like it's doing a good job of finding corners. This one over here is just kind of a general. It's finding edges really well in general. And the point is, if you had, you know, you can do multiple different filters. You don't have to pick just one kernel and one filter. You can do four or eight or 10 or 12 or whatever you want. That's why when they show the image and after the convolution step, you'll notice that there are multiple images. That's because you can apply multiple different kernels to your image during the convolution. And some might be a better job of finding colors, but some others might be a better job of finding vertical lines or horizontal lines. The point is that this all happens in the first step, followed by pooling, just to make it so there's less data that we have to do calculations on, that it just pulls out just the key information, right? And then we do another convolution step, and this allows us to combine simple shapes to make more complicated shapes. Hence why we do this convolution, and then we pull that, and you can do this several times if you want, okay? So how exactly does this kernel give us this shape over there? Let's do an example. I think this is worth our time. Okay, let's imagine for a moment that I have, a, uh, this is our data. You can see that there are six columns and the three on the left, these ones over here are all small values and these ones on the right are all large values. So this might represent in your image a region where you had like dark followed by light. So it's a vertical line basically in your image. Well, how are we gonna find that with the filter? Let's start by identifying a filter. We're gonna use the so-called Sobel filter. The Sobel filter is this famous filter that was used early on that has this shape. Let's say it's got zeros going down the middle, negative one, negative two, negative one, positive one, positive two, positive one. Now when you take this kernel and you lay it over your image and start doing matrix multiplication, let's just see what happens. Let's pick this position first. Well, in that position, all of the pixels are the exact same. And this kernel is symmetric. So if we actually do the, the convolution, we're going to see that it's equal to negative 25, negative 50, negative 25, 0, 0, 0. And then it's positive 25, positive 50, positive 25. Well, if you add all of that together, what do you get? You just get zero. So if we were to sort of create a filter, you know, a, 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 a convolution of our first image, then that first position, that first position would just be filled with a zero. It wouldn't give us any signal because there's nothing, there's no vertical line there. Okay, not interesting. Let's move it over one and see what happens. Okay, now the convolution is right here. So now apply that same filter. You've got negative 25, negative 50, negative 25, then you got the zeros. But now look, you've got 100, 200, 100. So by my math, I look at this, that's 400 minus 100. That's a value of 300. And if you move this over one more time, right here, you would get the same thing. You'd get another 300. But if we add room for it to do it one more time over here, now because it's a symmetric matrix and the numbers are all the same, it's going to go back to being zero. So in other words, this would have identified some region where we would see pixels that are lit up bright because they correspond to a match for our given kernel that we gave it, right? And since uh, you know we, we sort of handpicked our kernel here to give one that gives us a vertical line, this would then give us an image like the ones you see here where there's certain types of shapes that get identified, right? Now, this was a three by three kernel. You could do more complicated kernels. Like here you see, these are all five by five kernels. 
Um, so you can try different shapes, nothing wrong with that. But here's the cool thing. Instead of guessing what the kernel should be yourself or trying to hand engineer what kernels to use, the coolest thing that convolutional neural networks do is that they learn these shapes on their own. You just make the values in this matrix, right? This matrix here, which represented our kernel, make those nine values a tunable parameter and have it try a bunch of things and right and it can learn on its own what it should look for in an image to identify features that are useful this is pretty cool and you can see cool examples of this like take a look at here the idea is that by combining multiple steps of convolution pooling and then another convolution pooling and another convolution pooling you can sort of build up abstraction in your ability to identify features the one on the left you see that we're just finding basic shapes flat lines, maybe a diagonal line, maybe a vertical, or maybe there's a gradient in color or just a single color. Well, when you then pool those and you do a convolution on those, now you start to build up simple models to get sort of, not, not simple models, simple features to get medium level features. So now you're getting you know circles and swirls and maybe stripes and things like that. And if you convolve that again, now you're getting things maybe that maybe look like real world shapes, like you're getting a beak or a honeycomb or like the wheel of a tire things like that, uh, which you now are able to feed into your fully connected network to identify patterns in that data to classify it or regress on it. Pretty cool. And in this is some real world data where they took a bunch of the same types of pictures of things, so like a bunch of different pictures of flamingos. They sent them through a, neural, a convolutional neural network and then they froze everything and they figured out what is the preferred input to maximize the prediction of some category like flamingo. And this is what the filters at, at a high level, right? These would, would be ones at the end. This is what they look like. You can kind of see that there's flamingos there, where this one like has very clear like pelican vibes, right? This sort of captures the so-called essence of an object. I mean, pretty cool. Pretty cool because we didn't have to tell it to look for a beak. We didn't have to tell it to look for scales, to tell it to look for wheels. It found these things on its own by just using convolution and abstraction of simple shapes into more complicated shapes, which is so cool, if you ask me, okay? so. Let's talk a little more about these filters, right? Um, the kernel does a bunch of things. First off, for one reason, like think how big images are. Nowadays, images, you know, your, your cell phone can capture images that are way insanely big, you know, many, many megabytes. And so that would be too hard to do a regular fully connected network. If you took every one of those pixels, it'd be like, you know, thousands and thousands of pixels you'd have to fully connect. That would be too slow. So one big advantage that CNNs have is that they can reduce the computational requirements because they reduce the dimensions of your picture to throw out pixels that you don't care about and just get the information that you do care about, right? So for example, here, let's imagine again that we're using a kernel and it's a three by three. If we start out with a five by five, you can see that as this sort of graphic, uh, this, this GIF is showing you, it's only able to convolve over it three times. So the final image is a now a three by three instead of a five by five. So we've done some reduced uh, dimension already. That's one advantage of this, right? Now what you might be already asking, well, what if I have a color image and it's not black and white? Well, great, no problem. You do this convolution, but you do it on each of your channels, your red channel, your green channel, and your blue channel. Then they typically add those up, right? They sum them together and that becomes your new output. That's typically what happens with color images, okay? Now, there's different ways to do convolutions. You know, I've shown you sort of a basic way to do it, but it gets more complicated. For example, there's valid padding and sane padding. In valid padding, you see a reduction in the dimensionality. So the blue would be your starting layer, right? And then when you're done, you see that it's now in this green layer. It's, it's reduced its dimensionality. Whereas over here, you start it out with your blue layer and it's a five by five and it finishes with a five by five. Well, how did they do that? They did that with a couple things. First off, you'll notice that in both of these images, the initial input they convolve over something slightly larger than that. They have a one cell padding going around the outside. However, on this one, take a look at how much the convolution moves each time. It's actually sliding over two pixels, right? Two pixels each time it's sliding over. So we'd say that it has a different stride than this one over here. And so the stride causes a reduction in dimensionality. And since it changed, again, we call that valid padding. Whereas over here, it's a stride of one and with the padding, that allows it so we actually preserve the dimensionality, or you can actually even increase it, right? Um, now, there's other ways to do this. It gets complicated. There's lots of tunable things you can do here. Something else that you can do is a dilated convolution. A dilated convolution allows us to take whatever our sample kernel is, but to apply it to a large area 
by skipping pixels and when you apply it. All right, let me explain what that means. Let's imagine that this is, you know, uh, if this was your original kernel, this green line here, it starts out there and then you slide it over maybe two. So this would be a stride of two, right? And then it puts the, the yellow values there and then you slide it over two and that puts the red one there with the red one there. Well, you can do it in a different way. You can take a larger kernel where you're basically just ignoring every other line. You see the pink ones are now skipped, right? And you're skipping every other line. So if you're on this yellow one, for a moment let's take a look at that yellow one you are intentionally skipping all of these and you are keeping the other ones right so by doing this convolution over a larger area um, it has some benefits uh, what are the benefits of this well dilated kernels compared to regular kernels they cover a larger area but it's doing the exact same multiplication you're just doing it on pixels that are more spread out so you cover a larger receptive area but with no loss of coverage. So imagine that you had like really, really high resolution picture that you're starting with. Well, there's all sorts of little tiny flickering grain noise if, if you zoomed in far enough. Maybe that's your regular filters aren't gonna catch that because they're only looking in a three by three area, but you really need to be looking at a 10 by 10 area of pixels. This is one way to do that is by just doing a large dilation of your first kernel, right? Um, they're computationally efficient because you're covering a larger area at the same cost they use less memory because you can skip the pooling step um, because this already uh, does a dimensionality reduction right you don't have to pool necessarily um, there's no loss of resolution though you're just doing a dilation instead of a pooling and the order of your data is maintained so some cool advantages to doing a dilated kernel but that that's one option okay so we've said a fair bit about convolutions and the kernels involved there let's talk a little more about pooling well pooling is done primarily to reduce the dimensionality but it also extracts important features. Again, if we have a really large image to start with, by the time we start doing convolutions, that's making copies of that image, so it's getting really big. So it's gonna be way too slow to train and to work with. So it's important to reduce how the dimensionality and get rid of the pixels that don't matter. And pooling does that because it says in some area, a two by two, a four by four, whatever shape area, give me something. You have options, you can either take the maximum value of that area or you can take the average value or other things. In practice, the most common thing to do is to take the maximum value because we just want to pull out the most important feature in that region. Um, that also has the benefit of doing what's called noise suppression, where basically all the other noise there just gets cut out entirely. Um, anyways, pooling is great primarily because it helps speed up these calculations, but it also can help the model focus on just what matters because you're reducing the dimensionality of the information. Okay. So I've already mentioned this, but the idea then is that with repeated steps of convolution pool, convolution pool, you go from the abstract to much more complex shapes until you go from basic things to things that look kind of like what you're trying to predict. Okay. Okay. Now, finally, remember that the, the all this stuff here that's happening in this step, the convolution and pooling, that's all just about finding your features. We haven't done anything to I, to correlate those features to some sort of output. And that's what has to happen in this final section in the fully connected layer. Once you flatten down all of your features that you think might matter because you applied a bunch of filters, now you connect them together in a fully connected layer with some sort of backpropagation. You're able to then uh, find out which ones matter and make uh, good classifications or regressions. Okay, so let's break this down into the steps. When you use a convolution or neural network, step one is you're going to randomly initialize all of your filters, your parameters, and your weights. So the parameters and weights, that's what's happening in your uh, fully connected component. The filters are your kernel values, right, and your convolutions. Those all get given random values. Now step two, the network takes these training images as an input. It goes through a forward pass, right? It propagates all the way through doing its convolutions, pooling operations. You typically follow a convolution with a ReLU just to condense the data down to normal numbers again. Um, when you're done with that, you calculate the probabilities of each class. You keep track of those. Three is you calculate the total error at the output layer. Four, we're going to now use backpropagation to calculate the gradients of that error with respect to the weights in the network and the gradient descent. We'll use that to update all of the filter values, all of the weights, all the biases, all these parameters, right, uh, in, a, in a way to try and minimize the output error. And then we just repeat this over and over. So it's just like a neural network. The difference is that we have this built-in couple steps that allow us to find features in a really clever way that works really well when your data pixels, like the pixels in your image, are spatially, it, it matters that they're related to one another. If you just have a list of materials properties and 
there's spatially the data in your array isn't related one with another, then the convolutional neural network is probably not going to be a useful tool for you. But for images, we know that it is a really powerful one. Now, a quick thing to note that parameters like the number of filters that you use or how big of those filters, is it a 3x3 kernel, is it dilated, is it stride, all that stuff, the architecture of your network, all of that stays fixed when you're doing, uh, when you actually do the training. That stuff gets changed as you do hyperparameter tuning. But when you're actually training your model, that all stays the same. The only things that are getting changed are the tunable parameters like the values to put in your filter and your weights and biases. Now, this is just too cool not to show you, but there's this great website, cs.ryerson.ca. He has these awesome visualization tools that allow you to see in real time what is a convolutional neural network doing. Let's hop over and take a look at those. Okay, check it out. It says an interactive node link visualization of convolutional neural networks by Adam Harley. So huge props to him. This was featured in uh, Popular Science. So, so cool. Check it out. Let's go to one that's easy to see. Like, let's do a two-dimensional convolutional neural network visualization. I like this one. Okay, when you land on this page, give it a moment to load, and you'll see that it has a built-in architecture. You can't change like the number of pooling versus convolutions. You can't change um, the number of filters they use. It's already set, but it's still pretty rad. You can go ahead and you can draw a number here and have it try and predict which number you're drawing. And then it shows you in real time from your drawing how the convolutional neural network is coming to that prediction. So let me draw the number three there. And in real time, you see, it took my input, which was a high resolution image, and it compresses it down to a 28 by 28 drawing in just grayscale, right? So a number between zero and 255 or whatever, right? Now the next layer up, take a look here, you're seeing that these are convolutions and they're doing six different filters. And at each one of these pixels you hover over, it'll tell you the region of the image that it's convolving over, right? Over here at that top point, well, it's convolving over that top point of my main image. And you'll see that in these six different filters, they're paying attention to different things. Like this one is looking at vertical lines. This seems to be looking at horizontal lines. This is kind of a diagonal one. This is the other direction diagonal. Who knows what's going on here, right? And then it takes these and we reduce their dimensionality by just keeping the most important bits by doing a pooling layer. And again, it'll show you what things are getting pulled together in these sort of visualizations, which is so amazing. Now, these still look like the, the filters, sort of. They're lower resolution. But when we do another convolution, look at these funky shapes that get created, right? There's more of them now. I haven't counted, but there's more of them. You can see that it's actually taking from several of these things to make a single one. It's, con it's doing the convolution off of several images, not off a single one, right? And then when those get pooled, it's even stranger still. Like, who knows what these things are? So now that's the end of our feature extraction step. So now we flatten all of that down into a single one-dimensional vector, right? You can see where it's pulling that information from for all of these things, right? And then it does a fully connected network, so you can see how these are all connected with one another, which is so cool. And then it shows you that it thinks that number is a three based off of how those are all connected together. In real time, it does this, and you can change it, and you can intentionally draw a number that isn't even a number, right? Let's go ahead and erase this. And this time, let's draw something that's not even a number and see what it does. So that kind of looks like a six, it kind of looks like a zero, kind of looks like an eight, and check it out. In terms of its probability, it's less certain now. It thinks it's a zero, but it also thinks it's a six, kind of thinks it's an eight. It even kind of thinks it's like a one or a two, right? And you can see again where it's paying attention to it. So there's some really amazing tools that sort of open up the black box of how exactly convolutional neural networks are able to do this feature extraction. It is such a powerful technique, um, anyways glad to talk about it today. So in our next video, now that we've talked about the basics of convolutions and convolutional neural networks, we're going to turn our attention to recurrent neural networks. So stay tuned. See you in the next video.